Together with a raiding party of crack archaeologists, Neil and I were chugging our way up the Firth of Forth to attempt a landing on the island of Inch Keith. We were here to investigate the island's fortifications that stretch all the way from the 16th to the 20th century. Inch Keith is an extraordinary place. Barely a mile long, it's covered with fascinating reminders of its long and dramatic history. The whole island is now scheduled as an ancient monument and protected by law, but we've been lucky enough to get permission to be able to work here. It was first occupied in the 7th century by Christian monks, but not all residents came here of their own volition. It's been used as a giant isolation ward for syphilis sufferers and on time as a prison. Now it was going to be our home. What we're envisaging is a sea view <laughs> orientated on the It's not really difficult to work yes. out a sea view, is it? <laughs> hey, Neil. Need one more. Oh, first blood. Just lying there. It's a three or three round. <laughs> The strategic importance of the Firth of Forth, with its safe anchorage and Scotland's capital on its shore, has meant that Inchkeith, from its vantage point at the mouth of the estuary, has witnessed centuries of military aggression. The Danes and the Dutch, the English and the Russians, the French and finally the Germans have all tried their luck here. But from the 16th century onwards, plucky, resolute Inchkeith has been defended against all comers and become a master in the art of fortification. Are you sure you weren't really Seagull poo and everything. Have you got the beer? Come back! After the team had given us a hand with all the equipment and inspected the island ready to start work tomorrow, they abandoned us. Being marooned on a volcanic rock jutting out into the North Sea just didn't seem to appeal. <laughs> oh, God. You sure it's a good idea, Stevie? Mind you, it's, it's whipping up a bit out there. I know, but at least we're not going to be rocking. But, but, welcome to Alcatraz. No one has ever escaped. <laughs> Come on, I'm going in one of those underground bunkers. <laughs> well, maybe not. You're welcome to... Oh. oh, well, you look at that. That's lovely. Red sky in the morning, no digging team. <laughs> 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 Look, eww, not out of the canopy, burned to death. <laughs> you don't think we've pushed the boat out a bit too far this time? I'm, Coming here. I'm feeling a bit lonely. <laughs> it's fairly desperate for doing this on the first night. Look at it, all I can see around me is Scotland. <laughs> on the other side of miles and miles of water. Walking first thing by gulls. We headed off to the unmanned lighthouse to survey our new kingdom. Stretched out all around us is really what you could call the lost civilization of Inch Keith. It's like one of these lost cities that Indiana Jones had come across in the jungle. And throughout its history, the island's had various owners and occupants, and each one of those groups has stamped their own identity on the island. They've destroyed earlier buildings to build new ones, literally building right on top of the earlier stuff. And all those layers of fortification and building work have built up on top of one another like successive coats of paint, and we're interested primarily in four main phases. You've got a 16th century fort built by French soldiers, then there's Victorian buildings, then there's stuff from the First World War, then stuff from the Second World War. And it's these changes in the art of fortification that we're interested in looking at. And despite that interest, we can't overlook the peaceful stuff. And this lighthouse that we're in now is obviously dedicated to saving lives. And this was built in 1803, but ironically from stone rubbed out of the walls of the earlier 16th century French fort. And so what you've got down here is the modern lighthouse complex, these modern buildings, but in amongst that are traces of the 16th century fort. Inch Keith's name derives from the Gallic word Inch meaning island and the word Keith meaning battle. Inch Keith, the island of battle. 
Hey, hey. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. How's it going? With our forces safely ashore, we could now begin the archaeological battle to discover the island's military past. Amidst the jumble of buildings near the lighthouse, we were going to be searching for the remains of the 16th century French fort, the earliest fortification on the island built during a very turbulent time in Scotland's history. In 1547, at the height of the rough wooing, which was a period when England was trying to bully the infant Mary, Queen of Scots, into a marriage with Edward, the son of King Henry VIII, a force of English and Italian soldiers came out here to start building a fort, and they were using it as a base so that they could keep on with this rough wooing and keep on hassling the people of Scotland and keep the pressure on. So the island comes under military occupation for the first time. Mary, Queen of Scots, is a little girl, but her mother, Mary of Guise, is a different kettle of fish. She's a very strong character. She has her daughter sent back to France, and at the same time she brings in French soldiers because she has it in mind to evict these squatters once and for all. And she pulls off just two years later, in 1549, a troop of combined Scottish and French soldiers set out down the Forth as if they're just going for a cruise, but in fact they bring their boats around in ever-decreasing circles around Inch Keith and they launch a fantastic amphibious assault under the brilliant generalship of the French general Des, and they force the English occupiers back through their own half-built fort right up to the cliff edge and they give them a stark choice, either jump or surrender, and the occupiers surrendered. So now the island is back in Scottish and French hands. Once the French were in control of the island, they built Inchkeith's first complete fort. We'd managed to identify and isolate the surviving thick stone walls of this fort, which stood out from the later buildings. John, our surveyor, was now perched perilously on a cliff, busy mapping them. This allowed us to take his survey of the wall and superimpose it onto the only surviving record we have of the fort, a simple sketch outline of the floor plan. We had a match for the eastern wall. We could now see where the rest of the fort would have sat and that it was an impressive 100 metres long and 50 metres wide, an imposing deterrent to any invader. It was almost 300 years later before Inch Keith was next fortified. In 1881, the Victorians built three forts here. We were going to be working at the largest of these, switching our attention from 16th century to 19th century defences. In contrast with the French fort that was protected by high walls, deep ditches and caponiers defended the Victorian forts. Right, well, what we thought would be quite nice would be to put a trench straight across from the base of the, the ditch up to the wall of the caponier here. Right, should we get this? Vegetation and stuff scraped off the top first. We wanted to understand just how effective these defences would have been, but before we could get started, there was a hidden hazard to overcome. The potential danger of live ammunition left over from the island's past. So out came the metal detector and Ian was put on minesweeping duty. All the Victorian forts were defended in the same way, the principle was to sandwich the buildings and guns in between two massive defensive ditches. Any potential attacker would have to cross these in order to get inside. A job made even harder by the addition of a caponier in their centre. This was the Victorian equivalent of a pillbox, deadly in any language. We left the others to carry on as we went off to snoop around the Victorian fort. It's all built underground, so to find our way into the Caponier, next to where we were digging, we had to head into the heart of the complex. Right, that Caponier must be over here, somewhere. Yeah. Oh, look at the state of it, look. It's the same bit of days, isn't it? Slime. Oh, it gets worse. Oh, trust me. Oh, oh. oh it's Dickensian. Some horrible dungeon. <laughs> Bloody hell, look at it. The Victorians built three forts on Inch Keith. We're in the bowels of the most southern of those forts. We're actually in the Caponia, in the base of the ditch. And our trench is just somewhere outside there. We can hear them working. 
And this, this is really where the last ditch defence would take place. Because to be in here, the men, the enemy would already be at the gates. They'd be swarming into the ditch. Because what these rifle slots allow them to do is actually fire down the yeah. bottom of the ditch. Yeah, you can cover every direction, so if things have gone really pear-shaped and these ditches have been overwhelmed by the enemy and they're coming towards you, you can pin them down through these rifle slots for as long as you've got ammunition. Being in here has given me the absolute heebie-jeebies. I'd yeah. rather face the, the, the enemy at bayonet point. Oh, look up there! Oh, oh, oh it's like God. alien! Oh, spied, horrible big spiders. Right, move, 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 move. <laughs> We're going to have to come back in here as well. I'm not coming back we'll in. We'll send back to you. Yeah. Send him in naked. <laughs> naked and alone. <laughs> the Victorian forts were designed not only to defend themselves and the island, but also to control the mouth of the Firth of Forth. This was made possible for the first time by their powerful new gun technology. Any ship that attempted to sail up the estuary would have to pass right underneath Inchkeith's guns. The only military force ever brave enough to do this was in fact the Victorian Navy. I'd invited along Norman Clark, an expert on the island's defences, to explain about this bizarre behaviour. In the 1880s, Britain had been involved in a, a, an action at Alexandria. It was in connection with uh, a small war that the Victorians got themselves involved in. Yeah. And they had taken a fleet of ships out and bombarded forts at Alexandria. Um, and the results were not impressive. So they decided that the best way to test how their weapons were performing was to do it for real, in effect. Bang away at something. That's right. So they brought HMS Sultan up here, which had been involved in the bombardment of Alexandria, and they shelled this fort. So there was a fair amount of ordnance got, got flung at the island. Were there guys up here taking that? The actual crew obviously weren't, weren't here and they didn't go that far. Right. But what they did was they cut out um, wooden outlines of the gun crew, right. lent them against the guns as they would be when the gun was being loaded, and for a muzzle loader that's the point at which most crew are exposed. Right. Um, they then fired at the, at the gun with a series of weapons, then came back on and effectively looked for for damage and tried to work out what, what the effects would be. How many gummies bought it? Well, there were seven crew that were there and surprisingly not all of them got hit. I can't see what their mental state would have been in after the bombardment, but yeah, they weren't actually hit. Was all this conducted in secrecy? No, no. There were organised excursions on boats. In fact, at one point they had to stop the firing because a boat got between Sultan and the <laughs> island, you know, with, with the sightseers. And no doubt there was some Victorian entrepreneur there selling red up shrapnel and... <laughs> Excellent. What a grand day out. That's right, a grand day out. <laughs> the defences had proved themselves a match for the Royal Navy's finest, which came as no surprise to us. Our work in the defensive ditch had shown us just how solid they were. We've taken this trench as far as it can go. We're right down on the bedrock at the bottom of the rock-cut ditch, and this would have been the original floor of the ditch. What came as quite a surprise is this concrete slab that covers half of the, half of the ditch bottom here. The Caponia was built in the Victorian period. At that time, it appears to have had an arched door or window in it, which is more clearly visible from the inside. But at a later date, it was blocked up. They decided they didn't want it anymore, and they blocked it up. I can understand why they didn't want it, because it would be a point of weakness. And what they've done then is poured concrete along the floor of the trench to actually strengthen that repair. But an interesting connection to that repair is, is the... Because you found a door, didn't you? Yep, it was just lying over there. It was just found up there at the other end of the trench. An old wooden door there that they found in the fill, just above... some height above the original floor of the trench. Now. There's a door very similar to that lying on the floor of the caponier inside at the foot of the stairs. It's got similar colour on it as well. Little Same paint job. Yeah. So that door must have been flung out at that opening before this repair was made. What I can't understand fundamentally is why they would put that window in. Because there are, there are openings in it, but all those openings are just rifle slots. So. Bit of a mystery. Yeah, maybe someone got carried, maybe the architect got carried away and liked the. a bit fond of arches. He's got his wrist slapped and that to. Now that'll have to go, mate. Brick it up, and that's what's happened there. So all we've got to do now is record this, because it's, it's finished. The defensive ditch was a very basic structure, but its impressive dimensions 
combined with the 12 gun slits in the Capania, would have made it a formidable obstacle and given even the most determined attacker something to think about. In contrast to the 16th century fort, which simply took advantage of the natural defences that this island provided, by the time of the Victorians, they had the kind of powerful technology that enables them to really leave their mark here and really uh, stamp their image on the place. It's the, the peak of the Industrial Revolution. It's then that technology really starts to kick in. And on the island at that time, we have the, st the start of an arms race, which can be seen in the traces that we found of the Victorian batteries, the Victorian fort, and the rock cut ditches. And after the Victorians, this island is not left behind. The changes that affect military technology all around the world also leave their mark here on Inch Keith. Hey, Neil, this breeze is up. Should we try the kites? Excellent, yeah. Oh. Oh. Here, Lee. With the advent of the 20th century came the rise of air power and other military advances. Land it, Neil. Which meant that Inchkeith's Victorian defences needed updating. Nice, 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 nice. Oh, oh, oh. I need to give it a bit more throttle. During the two world wars, the island was conscripted into service as part of what became known as Fortress Fourth. And at its height, it bristled with guns and had a staggering 900 soldiers crammed onto it. Hey, Neil, the boat's coming in. Right. It was at this phase in the art of fortification that we were now going to direct our archaeological firepower. The defences from the two world wars only date back to our parents and grandparents' generations, but many of them have already been completely covered by earth and rubble. No! Oh. Right, come on, big holes, we better go and do some work. We'd chosen three areas of investigation, all dedicated to the active defence of the island. We began by enlisting Ian and set out to search for part of the island's last line of defence against invasion. Here we are. We were looking for what's called a fire trench. This was a simple trench that ran the length of the island's cliffs and gave cover to soldiers guarding the beaches from potential enemy raiders. Windy enough in the summer, it must have been a bleak place to be on duty during the Scottish winters. Oh, here we go, brothers. What have we got? Eh? It's the, non, it's the non business end. We're supposed to find them till we dig. Wow. Mm. 303 again. That do you? Yeah. That's just what we want. Whilst John continued his survey of the island's buildings, we got Helen started trying to find a First World War gun emplacement. Yeah. Okay, okay. Who did this? You're just getting bangled up today. Yeah. Aren't you? Who did that? Who made knots in there? It wasn't me. And finally, on a very unpromising site in the middle of the island, I set the last member of the platoon to work. Uh, believe it or not, what we've got is a um, sort of a half circle, semicircle of concrete coming round from the back of this bunker roof. Ah, uh, I've got you. But um, as to what it is, I mean, it's probably a small machine gun nest. Yeah. It'd be nice to find some empty Bren cartridges in the bottom. Oh, that would be fantastic. When the First World War began in 1914, all of the fortifications up and down the fourth were amalgamated into one integrated system. They were arranged into three lines of defence, each stretching from one shore to the other. Inch Keith stood smack bang in the middle of the outer line. No sea attacks were launched against this formidable array during the whole of the First World War. But just 21 years later, in 1939, war was declared again. Inch Keith needed us. It was time to join up. Andy. So we'd invited along Andy Robertshaw from the National Army Museum to act as Sergeant Major and put us through our paces. Okay, Bill. Come and try. Welcome ashore. Thank you very much. You gotta choose whether you fight or fly. I'm at last, lads. Put the cap on. Good God. 
I think any self-respecting battery sergeant may have a fit when he saw this. Well, this is tidy. Yeah. No, it it's isn't. What well, a tidy desk for you. Arrival. No, it's not good enough at all. Look. Cleaner's only just left. What I've got here is from the public record office, it's in the battery records. This is a kit layout from Inch Keith. That's what it should look like. Uh, your kit's there in the uh, two light-coloured bags. Um, weapons are to one side. If you um, can lay it out, make it look like that. Give me a child, take a seat. Oh, great. All yours. Fantastic. I knew there was trouble brewing. Ah, uh, you can do it. Right, we better make some room. How much time have we got? Are we working against the clock here? Certainly are. We better bring these out a bit. Yeah. For her stand that and fear a Robert Shaw. What have we got? Excellent. Old hippie great coat. Great. I'm gonna get a ballpoint pen and write ACDC on my bag, Neil. <laughs> Just like old times. Did I mention that today's a salt water day? Salt water day? Yeah, you get warm water and fresh water on Wednesdays and Sundays only. I mean, we have to wash in the sea. That's right. It's all gone horribly wrong. Mug. Mug. Right. I'm feeling a bit something. panicky. This is all sounding rather frightening. Send me into battle, please. Right. There's been a mountain of mestins on the, on the right, that right-hand bed. Oh, yeah, Neil. What? Your mestins are a mess. I'm coming to that. Where's that Bren gun? Dear old Brenda. She's a big girl, you know. 28 pounds. 28 pounds. <sighs> oh, it's messing my strapping, my right. webbing. Your bed's not long enough, Neil. Are these regulation length beds? Oh, we're in trouble. Oh, there's nothing we'll worse. Go. We'll be on a charge. Yeah. Great. Get him in. Get him in. Stop all your beds. <sighs> go on. End of the bed. Let's start then at attention, which means basically thumbs level with your seams in your trousers. Seams. And then add it. Oh. Yeah, if you add them. And then add ease. Slide your left leg out. Hands behind the back. That's better. Now, stiffen up. It's an inspection. Um, then what I'll do is have a look at this. That's loose. Popper's undone. Weapons, hmm, passable. Um, very, very loose. That's better, much better. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, the hair won't do at all. It's only a wig. Totally well, it doesn't Chinstrap. matter. What we're going to do now is get you into all the gear. Two kit bags behind you. I've got your uniforms in and your boots. Um, so, as you ready? Thank you. Great. Man's a bully. He is. By the left. Yeah. Pretty impressive. See. Apart from those boots. Oh. Yeah, the boots I would like to complain to the quartermaster that I don't even have a pair. Bob the Builder's been wearing these, <laughs> sir. <laughs> he certainly has. He's been doing some building work in them as well. Um, not bad, actually. Not bad. Well, I think what we're going to do now is a little bit of um, musketry. Oh, um, where can we go? Where, where do you want to go? Go up to the 9.22. Well, let's not march, shall we? Let's not push our luck. Yeah. Should we just amble up there? After you, sir. I'll we, lead we on. on. Don't hit each other with the end of those barrels. Now, do you know where you are? No, I don't. Edinburgh's behind us. You can even see the castle from here. Oh, yeah, you can. Lovely view. Yeah. And the fourth bridge is right behind us in that yeah. direction. Yeah, behind that wall. Open sea out to there. Yeah. And then, of course, you've got Rosyth, the shipyard, beyond oh, yeah. the bridges themselves. So we're right in the middle of the fourth. Yes. You're toward the mouth, bang in the middle of it. So yeah. anybody going to attack raiders this way? Yeah. If anything's coming in, it's coming in here. So you have then got to think about the fact that although you might be a gun number or an ammunition number or a gun captain, you might have to operate one of these. Mm -hmm. Well, tell you what, put the bipod down and then lie down and we'll talk it through if you like. Right. If you're lying down, you're a nice small target, which is oh, going to be very you. reassuring. I've got you. Have you ever handled a gun before? Well, when I was a very young lad, I was actually in the Army Cadets, I fired both of these weapons in anger, for real. At targets, oh, I hasten to okay, add. Fine. But I have, I have fired them. Really? Boy soldier. But I'll see if I can remember the drill. That's the safety catch on. Yeah. Safety off. Bolt open. Five rounds. Uh, there we are. Five that, rounds. Easy for you. Now, this magazine will take two of these clips, so this, when it's fully loaded, it'll have ten bullets in it. That's it. Clip. First one in the breech. Safety on. And well, that's me ready to go. And... Five rounds, independent. First round. Yeah? Yeah. With this weapon, it's different. Yeah. Your magazine has got 28 rounds, rather uh -huh. than just having 10 rounds in it. Yeah. And all you're going to do is pull back that cocking lever there with your right hand. Careful with your cocking lever, Neil. And be and careful. And then, uh, yeah. pull the trigger. That will oh, fire one easy. round. 
And what you then get is a mixture of gas and recoil, throws back all the working parts, it recocks itself, and as long as your finger's on that trigger, it'll continue to fire. Right. But obviously you don't want to fire it all up at once. So when I was in the cadets, I was told that when you, when you depress the trigger, you said in your head, Johnny, get your gun. And after you'd said that, you would release the trigger, and it gave you, it gave you a controlled burst, so you go, Johnny, get your gun, release. Johnny, get your gun, release. And you would say that, I think, four or five times before the magazine was empty. If I wasn't doing my Johnny, get your gun routine, how long would it last with a finger on the trigger? You could empty it in about five seconds. Oh. Anyway, what's your target at the moment? Well, I see the swastika flying from that ship there, actually. <laughs> it's full of them. Creed's Marine. Simple as that. Take them out, Neil. Yeah. It's you and me. Oh, God, it's a cabin boy. That's Come. against the Geneva Convention, Neil. It's against the cabin boy's convention, that's for sure. <laughs> I've got cramp. Finish him. The war must be over. <laughs> but we're tired to the naffy. I think so. I think it's a very good idea. I might retire to the osteopath. <laughs> How are your knees feeling? Shot to pieces. Oh, we're archaeologists. We don't have knees. <laughs> I think we gave them hell. Oh, I think so. Don't anybody call me stupid boy. <laughs> You're doing well. Dispatch from the machine gun nest reported something intriguing, so I went to investigate. Paul! Oh, yeah, I thought he had the voice. <laughs> Mistake! <laughs> You're not digging deep enough. I'm getting there. What's the story with the plastic? Well, we kind of came across this at the start. This was the first one that I uncovered. And... Oh, you got lettering. Yeah. I don't know if you make it out, but there's... It's still What's driving. that say? W... A... R... N... I... N... G... Today's Sesame Street <laughs> has been brought to you by the word WARNING. <laughs> So I got that, and yeah. then kept going for a little bit. And I've kept some of the soil on this to try and keep the rain off it again. <laughs> but there's that, which is a bit difficult to make out. Uh -huh. But it looks like an A-C-T-I-C-E. Practice, maybe? Practice. And then areas practice underneath areas. it. Practice areas. Maybe it's tied into to the batteries, because we know we've got a practice battery. Yeah. So maybe they're looking yeah. out from here with range finders or something, checking it, the the fall of the shells and the lying of the guns. Well, I suppose it would make sense, because you've got a really good sort of panoramic yeah. view of the whole, this end of the island from here, so... So maybe it's not a machine gun nest after all. Could be something else. I was looking forward to those Bren cases. <laughs> well done, that's amazing. I'm worried it's going to start filling up with water now with the rain. The writing's on the wall. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll see you later. <laughs> see you later, then. Ta-da. See you. New military technology in the Second World War meant that the defences needed another revamp. The principle of three lines of defence was retained from the First World War, but the lines were pushed further out to sea in order to engage the enemy earlier. Consequently, Inchkeith now found itself in the middle line, rearmed and ready for action, and they didn't have long to wait. On the morning of the 16th of October 1939, German reconnaissance planes are spotted over Rosyth and the Fourth Bridge, and Spitfires are put up into the sky to take them on. Flight Lieutenant George Pinkerton of 602 Squadron, based at Turnhouse, sets out in his Spitfire. He becomes the first British pilot to take a Spitfire into real action against the enemy in World War II. But this German pilot makes good his escape. On the afternoon of the same day, German bombers make their first attack on the British mainland, and that attack too comes to Fortress Forth. The German bombers have come looking for HMS Hood. Their intelligence has told them it's in the Firth of Forth, but they're wrong. The hood is elsewhere at this time. What they do find are three light cruisers, HMS Southampton, HMS Edinburgh and HMS Mohawk. So they launch their attack on those ships. Shrapnel and machine gun fire near HMS Mohawk kills three officers and 13 men. So for the first time we now have blood being spilt in Fortress Forth. Around the Firth of Forth, machine guns and Lewis guns open fire on these enemy planes. There's even stories of people in Edinburgh going out into their back gardens and firing at the enemy planes with their shotguns. George Pinkerton, who had been in the air in the morning, goes up again, and together with another Spitfire pilot, they go in pursuit of one of these Junkers bombers, and they strafe it with machine gun fire, and it goes down into the sea. Elsewhere, Pat Gifford of 603 Squadron is in the sky in his Spitfire. He locks onto one of these Junkers as well, blasts away at it, and it goes down into the sea in flames. The crew of that bomber are relatively lucky. One of them is never seen again, but three are alive and are fished out of the sea by local fishermen. The story 
of World War II has only just begun and Inchkeith and Fortress Forth are right in the thick of it. John Dixon, one of the fishermen who rescued the German airmen on that eventful day, still lives in Port Seaton. It was the perfect excuse to escape the island for a while, so we headed off to visit him. see happen on the day of the raid? Well, it, it was just another day, uh, you know, the 16th, of course, and we were fishing that day at our usual spot at the May Island when we seen this big plane uh, coming down and there were two Spitfires following her. And when they got off clear of the land, they started zooming on her. Blasting her with bullets, one after the other, just sort of in a circle. And they were blasting her away. And it couldn't, it didn't last long at that. So, um, came down. I says to my father, I says, Dad, I says, you better go and see if there's any survivors out there. Oh, my brother said, don't worry, don't worry about them. Get into the harbour. So he wasn't very keen at all? Uh, not at all. And, uh, he says, uh, they maybe kill half the people in Edinburgh and then maybe brought the four bridge down for all you know. Mm -hmm. I says, never mind. I says, Father, you have two sons, we'll be in the Navy. How would you like if anybody were to turn them back on your sons, mm -hmm. if they could yeah. be saved? So we turned and went to this, the plane and here we seen three heads bobbing up and down, holding on to the undercarriage, splattered with blood, you know. Anyway, we got the men on board and we proceeded for Port Seaton. And uh, the pilot, he took his ring off and gave it to my father. Oh, wow. Can I take it? That's beautiful. See the coat of, uh, coat of arms on it? And the German, the eagle, eagle wings. Oh, is that the wings up at the top? Yes. Yeah. And my wife, she gave me the uh, the diamond for my Christmas. Right. So that wasn't on the ring when when you gave no. it. No. Just, no. just the gold. Yeah. Yeah. The That's a real wings. weight. Uh, isn't it? No wonder he gave it. You'd sing with it on. <laughs> There's no fool that man. Yeah. And you wear, you've worn that ever since. Ever since, when I'm when I'm uh, uh, dressed, not when I'm working. Anyway, we get ashore, and to keep ourselves right, we went for the police. Mm -hmm. They came down, and they were taken to Edinburgh Castle. That's an amazing story. Aye. Incredible. Well, I'll never forget the Germans. Imagine all the people now living in this world. Imagine no possessions. Imagine no war. Back on the island, the team was digging for all they were worth. Ian had almost disappeared into his fire trench. Paul was coming closer to solving the mystery of the machine gun post. And in Helen's trench, we'd scored a direct hit. We found a gun mounting, and we're just cleaning it up at the moment. And you can see that there's, there's loads of detail still visible on it. But there, there is an impressive row of these things, all strung, strung out in a line across this terrace. But we had no idea that underneath there was such a massive fixture. And it's set in a half circle because, of course, it doesn't have to go a full 360 degrees because it's not meant to be firing into the island. It's meant to be firing out to sea, so its arcs of fire are like that. What we'd found was the mounting for a 4.7-inch gun. It had a maximum range of just over six and a half miles and was one of a line of eight strung out along the southeastern cliffs of the island. I left Neil and Helen and went on an inspection tour of the rest of the troops. Dr Banks, very nice. Yeah, best spot in the island. Can I come in? Yeah, if you stand on the... Destroying things. The big rock. Good grief. It's all right, isn't it? Life in the trenches. Yeah. 
I like this. Yeah. Is that what I think it is? Uh, well, it certainly works as a firing step. So it's all a very, very loose gravel on it the is. top of really compacted soil. Yeah, that's very, very hard. That's it, isn't it? Yeah. Great sea view. Yeah, shoot out from here quite happily. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. Well, we've got some seabirds anyway. Shoot down to the, you know, keep the pillbox covered. The trench was used in both world wars. It had a firing step at the front and would have been fronted by sandbags for extra protection. We even thought we'd discovered what the back step was for. I reckon this is a couch. It's very nice. It's really quiet, isn't it, and peaceful? Out the wind. If we had a telly, we could sit here all day like Beavis and Butthead. <laughs> this is terrible. Oh, Get me out the wind. <laughs> Beautiful day for it, isn't so it? So you've sorted yourself out in a little <laughs> hidey hole. Well, definitely uh, speeded up the digging process, put it that way. So what's the story? Remember our warning? Yeah, I remember your warning. Training. Actually, this is training. <laughs> it's amazing what you see when you want to see it, isn't well, it? Well, exactly. I just had a good brush down of the, the sides. That's come up really well. Up. I thought yeah, that would have brushed it off. I mean, it's stuck there quite well. Training. And our actus areas. So it is practice. Practice areas. Our degrees and, what, minutes or seconds? Yeah. Right. Presumably are these areas. Is there anything in the floor? Any... It's, uh, well, What's... the only thing is that little mountain in there, which is rapidly getting covered with dust. Yeah, so there's been something in there. So there's something in there. Because you would expect, if it was related to artillery, you would expect some sort of rangefinder. Yeah. Just so they could see where the, yeah. the stuff was falling and they know, making the splashes, able, They'd be basically. able to work out on the rangefinder these angles and know exactly which quadrants of water they were firing shells out at. Right. Uh... We'd uncovered a First World War battery command post. It housed a rangefinder and originally had a roof. Its job was to locate enemy targets and then relay that information back to the island's guns. So no machine guns? No machine guns, unfortunately. But it's an equally nice story. The story of the art of fortification on Inchkeith had taken us from the simple 16th century fort through increasingly complex defences right up to the Second World War when the island was integrated into mighty Fortress Forth. Tomorrow we'd be switching our attentions from the engines of war to the refuse of war, literally. Have you noticed there are no ships out there tonight, Neil? It is a bit it's quiet. usually a bit chocker out there. Mm. Imagine how busy it must have been during the war, all those boats trying to get into Rosyth. Yeah, warships, merchant ships, everything. It must have been like the M1 out there. And then you've got the Germans dropping mines from aeroplanes as well. It must have been pretty hairy. Yeah, that's not the worst of it as well. Some wee wifey in our house in, in Leith, she's in the kitchen. And it's, uh, it's the 21st of February, 1940. So there she is, minding her own business. Meanwhile, back out here, the battery commander spots an Admiralty trawler straying into a British minefield, mm -hmm. realises that, you know, they're dead meat if they go any further. Mm -hmm. And he orders a, a shell to be fired, a dummy shell to be fired across her bows. And the trawler gets the message, turns around and comes out of the minefield, but the shell hits the water and it's like a Barnes Wallace bouncing bomb before he even thought of it, and it shoots on, heads for Leith, goes through a factory building, straight into the wifey's flat in Salamander Street, narrowly missing her and her kids in the kitchen, hits the kitchen sink, takes that back out through the wall of the tenement, and finally impacts in sandbags in the Anderson Shetland in the back garden. And it goes down in history as the Battle of Salamander Street. And uh, according to local legend, uh, she had the thing posted back to the battery commander here with a little note on it saying, we believe this belongs to you. <laughs> an immediate problem that having hundreds of soldiers living on an isolated island poses is what to do with all the rubbish they produce. The most obvious solution is to simply throw it over the cliffs. And this is precisely what all the various inhabitants of Inchkeith have done down through the centuries. We began the third phase of our archaeological investigation on Inchkeith by heading to the most obvious source of 20th century rubbish. This must be the cookhouse right enough. Look at the size of that oven. Floor could do with a sweep. Oh, I'll say. Lovely. I what they used to cook in that. Oh, pigeon. Pigeon, maybe, yeah. How many meals that's had cooked in it? Mm. The old boiler. <sighs> a bit of 
the sad end for the cucumbers. Come on. Cooker's seen better days, eh? Yeah, I could do with some black leading, I think. Mm, thorough overhaul. <laughs> right, so if you brought your rubbish out, where are you going to it over the cliff at the nearest available point. Which would be... Just here, eh? How does it look? I'm not going down there. No, I think we'll find a, an easy way to get down. Rubbish dumps, or middens as we archaeologists call them, are very rich sources of information. They can tell us about diet, health, and even lifestyle. Our bin at home is usually full of takeaway cartons and beer cans, which definitely says something about us. Rich or slippy. Halfway up the cliff, looking like a landslide, was our cookhouse midden. Oh yeah, this looks like a baby. On the beach, our appetites were whetted by an early find. Oh, that's nice. A little needle. Oh, wood? No, no thanks, bro. Keep that. The only problem now was getting up to the midden proper. Right, careful, it looks <laughs> was mightily a, unstable. There was a bird there. Fulmer, something on the nest. What is a fulmer, yeah. Watch it, it'll spit at you. Look at this. That must be officer's gear. It's got gilt around the edge. You should call it a bit of tableware, that is. Oh, look, that had a stamp on it. It's just smashed off. Right. It's, that's heavy as stuff, but... It's packed full of stuff, isn't it? Oh, yes! That Naffy. Oh, your dancer. Navy, Army, Air. Let's come out of the canteen. A Naffy mug. There's a mug, isn't it? Oh, that's a beauty. A bit of but what had really got our archaeological juices going was the discovery on the other side of the island, underneath the walls of the 16th-century fort, of what we believed was a four to five hundred-year-old rubbish dump. All we needed to do now was dig it. Does anybody want to use the loo before we go down the hill? <laughs> I generally go before I get out of bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah. It's just under that wall. How the hell can we get down? I signed up for this snow because I didn't have a mountaineering to me. Yeah. <laughs> what do you reckon? Oh, why? What the hell? It's lovely, isn't it? That is really nice, actually. Were they always fish it? Yeah. Oh, wow. What we'll do is we'll take off this loop, this um, node at the front, yeah. sample that, and yeah. then once once we've got a stable face, we'll probably put a box column through it. Excavating middens containing shells requires a lot of patience and care. They can date back centuries as the same spot is used again and again to dispose of rubbish. Makes like a song. Mm. A bit of coo. Yeah. The careful sample we were removing from the face of the midden may contain tiny fragments of datable material. So everything, soil and all, is bagged, recorded, and then taken away for further specialised analysis. Now, but we couldn't wait that long, so we invited bone expert Catherine Smith to give us an initial analysis of some of our midden material. We found two middens on the island, and we pulled this crockery out of one of them. It's obviously Second World War. But in the other midden, we got this stuff, which would like your ideas on. Right, well, I can see at a glance that you have here a horse uh, leg. Oh. Horse? We thought it was cow. Yeah. Well, you'd be, I'd forgive you for thinking that. It's a similar size, but it is actually a hind leg of a horse. Mm -hmm. And it's what we would call a cannon bone or a metatarsal. And these are the, the toe bones or phalanges, first phalange, second phalange. Right. And uh, they're obviously articulating together. It's not from a very large horse, it's from something the size of a pony, um, something that would be about 14 two hands high right. in horse terms. And it's possibly an old horse or pony because it's had a, um, arthritis, perhaps just slight, but there are bony outgrowths around this surface here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the animal might have been lame. You know, it's possibly why it was killed. Perhaps it was too old to work. Would they do anything with it, with the body after they had 
Well, I, I've looked at this and I can't see any evidence of knife cuts anywhere on that bone that would tell me that that horse had been skinned, but it was actually common practice for horses to be skinned. You wouldn't just throw them away. Right. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to get a skin and sometimes to get meat, but there's no evidence from that particular horse that it's been eaten. Right, because the French, the French used to call this the island of horses. Yes. We were here in the 16th century, so maybe one of those horses that... It's quite possible. It's grazed here. Mm -hmm. What about this strange thing here? Well, I think that's probably part of the same horse. It's uh, the tail. These are caudal vertebrae. Okay. That so, would make sense because that, if that's the hind leg, that was found very close by. So yeah, maybe we've got an entire know, yeah, horse I, in I there. I would think that's probably the, the reason for that being there. Well, that's the horse. Mm -hmm. There's that thing which I thought might be just a bit of rabbit. No, oh, no, no. It's, a, it's actually from a chicken, ah. uh, from a hen. It's actually the, the bone from the drumstick. It's the tibia tarsus. And it's actually oh, right. from an immature bird as well. And it's a fairly large one. Uh, bigger than a bantam. So somebody's Kentucky Fried? I think so. No evidence of any uh, exotic spices on this one, though. Right. Having misidentified all of that, I can say we're on a bit safer ground here. Having dug a few shell middens in my time, we have some limpets, some periwinkles, but most of the shell midden deposit was made up of these things, these nice oysters. These aren't likely to be food though, are they, really? Well, the, or are they? well there's an argument about that. They're very tough t to eat, and they're actually tough to dislodge from rocks as well. If you've ever tried kicking one off... <laughs> I've eaten them raw. What, what did you think of them? They're, they're all right, but they are, they are rubbery. Yeah. They're, but, and, I mean, the Western Isles, they make them into broth and stuff. Yeah. The, the Scottish word for them is chuch. Yeah, tough. definitely. But um, these are these are completely edible. Periwinkle. And, and, uh, well, I would call it a wilk, actually. I'm from Dundee. A wilk. Yeah. <laughs> and the oysters, well, the fourth out there, um, was actually famous for the oyster beds. Um, we actually had so many oysters out there that we could export them to the low countries in the 15th and 16th centuries. We sent them pickled in barrels with brine. There's, a, there's an account by an early source which says that when the English were blockading the island, when the French and the Scots were on it, that the, the, there was no food getting through, so the people had to subsist on fish and shellfish, so maybe that's evidence of that. That, that might well explain it then, mm -hmm. because they were thought of as a famine or subsistence yeah, food. Yeah, right. Because we're working on the idea that it is related to the French fort, and it's just below the cliff, isn't it? It is, yeah. Where they throw all their rubbish down onto the beach. It's so far that's... more likely to have been associated with the, the 16th century. I, I think so. All in all, we've got the makings of a good meal. A little oyster starter, then through to the, the horse flesh. All washed down with no. <laughs> Navy tea, I don't think so. No, claret. Yeah. You'd have claret with your horse. claret. Any chance of another beer? Oops, there? Yeah, hang on. Nice. Take your time with that one, it's not a limitless supply. <laughs> down through the centuries, Inchkeith has served valiantly in the defence of Scotland and Britain. As we bade it goodbye, we could only hope it would never be called into service again.